Section 3 of The Life of Charlemagne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Charlemagne by Notker the Stammerer. Translated by Arthur James Grant. Section 3. Book 1. Part 3. In the same journey, too, he came to a bishop who lived in a place through which he must needs pass. Now on that day, being the sixth day of the week, he was not willing to eat the flesh of beast or bird, and the bishop, being by reason of the nature of the place unable to procure a fish upon the sudden, ordered some excellent cheese, rich and creamy, to be placed before him. And the most self-restrained Charles, with the readiness which he showed everywhere and on all occasions, spared the blushes of the bishop, and required no better fare, but taking up his knife cut off the skin, which he thought unsavory, and fell to on the white of the cheese. Thereupon the bishop, who was standing near like a servant, drew closer, and said, Why do you do that, Lord Emperor? You are throwing away the very best part. Then Charles, who deceived no one, and did not believe that any one would deceive him, on the persuasion of the bishop, put a piece of the skin in his mouth, and slowly ate it, and swallowed it like butter. Then, approving of the advice of the bishop, he said, Very true, my good host, and he added, Be sure to send me every year to X two cartloads of just such cheeses. The bishop was alarmed at the impossibility of the task, and, Fearful of losing both his rank and his office, he rejoined, My lord, I can procure the cheeses, but I cannot tell which are of this quality and which of another. Much I fear, lest I fall under your censure. Then Charles, from whose penetration and skill nothing could escape, however new or strange it might be, spoke thus to the bishop, who from childhood had known such cheeses and yet could not test them. Cut them in two, he said, then fasten together with a skewer those that you find to be of the right quality, and keep them in your cellar for a time, and then send them to me. The rest you may keep for yourself, and your clergy, and your family. This was done for two years, and the king ordered the present of cheeses to be taken in without remark. Then in the third year the bishop brought in person his laboriously collected cheeses. But the most just Charles pitied his labor and anxiety, and added to the bishopric an excellent estate whence he and his successors might provide themselves with corn and wine. As we have shown how the most wise Charles exalted the humble, let us now show how he brought low the proud. There was a bishop who sought above measure vanities and the fame of men. The most cunning Charles heard of this, and told a certain Jewish merchant whose custom it was to go to the land of promise and bring from thence rare and wonderful things to the countries beyond the sea, to deceive or cheat this bishop in whatever way he could. So the Jew caught an ordinary household mouse and stuffed it with various spices, and then offered it for sale to the bishop saying that he had brought this most precious, never-before-seen animal from Judea. The bishop was delighted with what he thought a stroke of luck, and offered the Jew three pounds of silver for the precious ware. Then said the Jew, A fine price indeed for so precious an article. I had rather throw it into the sea than let any man have it at so cheap and shameful a price. So the bishop, who had much wealth and never gave anything to the poor, offered him ten pounds of silver for the incomparable treasure. But the cunning rascal, with pretended indignation, replied, The God of Abraham forbid that I should thus lose the fruit of my labor and journeyings. Then our avaricious bishop, all eager for the prize, offered twenty pounds. But the Jew, in high dudgeon, wrapped up the mouse in the most costly silk and made as if he would depart. Then the bishop, as thoroughly taken in as he deserved to be, offered a full measure of silver for the priceless object. 
and so at last our trader yielded to his entreaties with much show of reluctance, and, taking the money, went to the emperor and told him everything. A few days later the king called together all the bishops and chief men of the province to hold discourse with him, and, after many other matters had been considered, he ordered all that measure of silver to be brought and placed in the middle of the palace. Then thus he spoke, and said, Fathers and guardians, bishops of our church, you ought to minister to the poor, or rather to Christ in them, and not to seek after vanities. But now you act quite contrary to this, and are vainglorious, and avaricious beyond all other men. Then he added, One of you has given a Jew all this silver for a painted mouse. Then the bishop, who had been so wickedly deceived, threw himself at Charles's feet and begged pardon for his sin. Charles upbraided him in suitable words, and then allowed him to depart in confusion. This same bishop was left to take care of Hildegard, when the most warlike Charles was engaged in campaigns against the Huns. He was so puffed up by his intimacy with her that he had the audacity to ask her to allow him to use the golden scepter of the incomparable Charles on festal days instead of his episcopal staff. She deceived him cleverly, and said that she dare not give it to any one, but that she would carry his request faithfully to the king. So, when Charles came back, she jestingly told him of the mad request of the bishop. He kindly promised to do what she wished, and even more. So, when all Europe, so to speak, had come together to greet Charles after his victory over so mighty a people, he pronounced these words in the hearing of small and great. Bishops should despise this world, and inspire others by their example to seek after heavenly things. But now they are misled by ambition beyond all the rest of mankind, and one of them, not content with holding the first episcopal see in germany has dared without my approval to claim my golden sceptre which i carry to signify my royal will in order that he might use it as his pastoral staff the guilty man acknowledged his sin received pardon and retired now my lord emperor charles I much fear that through my desire to obey your orders I may incur the enmity of all who have taken vows, and especially of the highest clergy of all. But for all this I do not greatly care, if only I be not deprived of your protection. Once that most religious Emperor Charles gave orders that all bishops throughout his wide domains should preach in the nave of their cathedral before a certain day, which he appointed under penalty of being deprived of the episcopal dignity, if they failed to comply with the order. But why do I say dignity when the apostle protests, he that desires a bishopric desires a good work? But in truth, most serene of kings, I must confess to you that there is great dignity in the office, but not the slightest good work is required. Well, the aforementioned bishop was at first alarmed at this command, because gluttony and pride were all his learning, and he feared that if he lost his bishopric he would lose at the same time his soft living. So he invited two of the chiefs of the palace on the festal day, and after the reading of the lesson, mounted the pulpit as though he were going to address the people. All the people ran together in wonder at so unexpected an occurrence except one poor red-headed fellow who had his head covered with clouts because he had no hat, and was foolishly ashamed of his red hair. Then the bishop, bishop in name but not in deed, called to his doorkeeper, or rather his scario, whose dignity and duties went by the name of the Aedial ship among the ancient Romans, and said, "'Bring me that man in the hat who is standing there near the door of the church.' The doorkeeper made haste to obey, seized the poor man, and began to drag him towards the bishop. 
but he feared some heavy penalty for daring to stand in the house of God with covered head, and struggled with all his might to avoid being brought before the tribunal of the terrible judge. But the bishop, looking from his perch, now addressing his vassals and now chiding the poor knave, bawled out and preached as follows, "'Here with him! Don't let him slip! Willy-nilly, you've got to come!' When at last force or fear brought him near, the bishop cried, "'Come forward! Nay, you must come quite close!' Then he snatched the head-covering from his captive, and cried to the people, "'Lo and behold, all ye people, the boor is red-headed!' Then he returned to the altar and performed the ceremony, or pretended to perform it, when the mass was thus scrambled through, his guests passed into his hall, which was decorated with many-colored carpets and cloths of all kinds, and there a magnificent banquet served in gold and silver and jeweled cups was provided, calculated to tickle the appetite of the fastidious or the well-fed. The bishop himself sat on the softest of cushions, clad in precious silks and wearing the imperial purple so that he seemed a king, except for the scepter and the title. He was surrounded by troops of rich knights, in comparison with whom the officers of the palace, nobles though they were, of the unconquered Charles, seemed to themselves most mean. When they asked leave to depart after this wonderful and more than royal banquet, he, desiring to show still more plainly his magnificence and his glory, ordered skilled musicians to come forward, the sound of whose voices could soften the hardest hearts or turn to ice the swiftly flowing waters of the Rhine. And at the same time, every kind of choice drink, subtly and variously compounded, was offered them, in bowls of gold and gems, whose sheen was mixed with that of the flowers and leaves with which they were crowned. But their stomachs could contain no more, so that the glasses lay idle in their hands. Meanwhile, pastry-cooks and sausage-makers, servers and dressers offered preparations of exquisite art to stimulate their appetite, though their stomachs could contain no more. It was a banquet such as was never offered even to the great Charles himself. When morning came, and the bishop returned some way toward soberness, he thought with fear of the luxury that he had paraded before the servants of the emperor. So he called them into his presence, loaded them with presents worthy of a king, and implored them to speak to the terrible Charles of the goodness and simplicity of his life, and above all to tell him how he had preached publicly before them in his cathedral. Upon their return, Charles asked them why the bishop had invited them. Thereupon they fell at his feet and said, Master, it was that he might honor us as your representatives, far beyond our humble deserts. He is, they went on, in every way the best and most faithful of bishops, and most worthy of the highest rank in the church. For if you will trust our poor judgment, we profess to your sublime majesty that we heard him preach in his church in the most stirring fashion. Then the emperor, who knew the bishop's lack of skill, pressed them further as to the manner of his preaching, and they perforce revealed all. Then the emperor saw that he had made an effort to say something, rather than disobey the imperial order, and he allowed him, in spite of his unworthiness, to retain the bishopric. Shortly after, a young man, a relation of the emperor's, sang on the occasion of some festival the Alleluia admirably, and the emperor turned to this same bishop and said, My clerk is singing very well. But the stupid man thought that he was jesting and did not know that the clerk was the emperor's relation, and so he answered, Any clown in our countryside drones as well as that to his oxen at their ploughing. At this vulgar answer the emperor turned on him the lightning of his flashing eyes and dashed him terror-stricken to the very ground. 
But though the rest of mankind may be deceived by the wiles of the devil and his angels, it is pleasant to consider the word of our Lord, who in recognition of the bold confession of St. Peter said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Wherefore, even in these times of great peril and wickedness, he has allowed the church to remain unshaken and unmoved. Now, since envy always rages among the envious, so it is customary and regular with the Romans to oppose, or rather to fight against, all strong popes who are from time to time raised to the apostolic see. Whence it came to pass that certain of the Romans, themselves blinded with envy, charged the above-mentioned Pope Leo of holy memory with a deadly crime and tried to blind him. But they were frightened and held back by some divine impulse, and after trying in vain to gouge out his eyes, they slashed them across the middle with knives. The Pope had news of this carried secretly by his servants to Michael, Emperor of Constantinople. But he refused all assistance, saying, The Pope has an independent kingdom and one higher than mine, so he must act his own revenge upon his enemies. Thereupon the Holy Leo invited the unconquered Charles to come to Rome, following in this the ordinance of God, that, as Charles was already in very deed ruler and emperor over many nations, so also, by the authority of the apostolic see, he might have now the name of Emperor, Caesar, and Augustus. Now Charles, being always ready to march, and in warlike array, though he knew nothing at all of the cause of the summons, came at once with his attendants and his vassals. Himself, the head of the world, he came to the city that had once been the head of the world. And when the abandoned people heard of his sudden coming, at once, as sparrows hide themselves when they hear the voice of their master, so they fled, and hid in various hiding-places, cellars, and dens. Nowhere, however, under heaven, could they escape from his energy and penetration, and soon they were captured and brought in chains to the cathedral of St. Peter. Then the undaunted Father Leo took the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and held it over his head, and then in the presence of Charles and his knights, in the presence also of his persecutors, he swore in the following words, So on the day of the great judgment may I partake in the promises, as I am innocent of the charge that is falsely laid against me. Then many of the prisoners asked to be allowed to swear upon the tomb of St. Peter that they also were innocent of the charge laid against them. But the Pope knew their falseness and said to Charles, Do not, I pray you, unconquered servant of God, give assent to their cunning, for well they know that St. Peter is always ready to forgive. But seek among the tombs of the martyrs the stone upon which is written the name of St. Pancras, that boy of thirteen years, and if they will swear to you in his name, you may know that you have them fast. It was done as the Pope ordered, and when many people drew near to take the oath upon this tomb, straightway some fell back dead, and some were seized by the devil and went mad. Then the terrible Charles said to his servants, Take care that none of them escapes. Then he condemned all who had been taken prisoner, either to some kind of death or to perpetual imprisonment. End of section 3